were we condemned at birth, caught in doubt. Howdy folks and welcome to another episode of the Rochester Indie Musician Spotlight. This is part one of our double header this week and I'm sitting down with Jeff Wilson. He is house sitting uh, for a friend of his, a Victor. We figured we'd do this poolside. It's a beautiful day. Enjoy the weather. Uh, Jeff, I met Jeff. I did a story on him for the Democrat and Chronicle about his 20-ish year teaching career. And uh, despite what he says, and probably will say again during this interview that he's not an interesting guy, he is. And I wanted to take the opportunity to not just talk about Jeff the teacher, but talk more about Jeff the dude, Jeff his music, and since he is a concert coming up on June 30th, Jeff Wilson in concert, I wanted to talk to him a bit. Jeff, thanks for talking to me. Thank you for talking to me, Dan. I'm excited. We are too. This is this is really cool for us because uh, this is we're trying to expand the kind of people that we do, and we know we have an interesting life and a di kind of different sort of music. So thanks. usually, how we start these things is the is the early life. Okay. Of Jeff Wilson, so maybe if you could tell us a little bit about little Jeff Wilson and uh, his relationship to music, and maybe some of the early formative stuff that got you into music and affected your musical development. Well, first of all, thank you for the um, nice interview that you did for the DNC, and thank you Very for welcome. mentioning my age. I was so excited to see that in print. <laughs> forty-three, yes, I am forty-three, America, forty-three and a half. Um, but the early years, I was actually lying in bed last night. I was trying to think of possible things that you would be asking me think uh, about, you know. And mm -hmm. and yes, I I do say that I am not interesting. But I, after I went through your article, I'm like, wow, I actually do sound somewhat interesting. <laughs> I guess I don't know. Um, I have, as I was saying earlier, I have a steel trap for a memory. I I actually was thinking back as I was laying in bed last night trying to think about back as far as I could go and I actually think I do have memories of being in the hospital <laughs> wow. and just like pictures like these weird pictures in my brain of, of like because my mom said I was born in the hallway um, I was supposed to be born on December 25th 1972 oh. I came out to December 28th dodge that bullet no, man. Dodged, birthday on Christmas Whoa. yeah dodge that bullet but I was so eager to come out on December, December 28th that I was I didn't make it until the delivery room I guess <laughs> so I'm like here I am world yeah. let's party um, but yeah I have that's probably the earliest memory I have possibly being in you know the hospital but early early Jeff I was I was just a kid you know I I remember my earliest musical memory is mm -hmm just remembering sitting at my grandmother's house. I was actually um, grew up in Holly, but my grandmother grew up in Polish town in um, the city, Hudson Avenue area, St. Jacob Street. And I just remember her piano and just sitting down at her piano and my aunt Kathy teaching me how to play chopsticks and heart and soul and just yeah. sitting at the piano being like five, six, seven, whatever. And I loved it. You know, I loved everything about the piano, and I'm like, this is this is incredible. You know, I press this, and something comes out. It's like this amazing sound, and like if I press more keys, like more sound comes out. And um, so as I grew up and going to my, especially going to my grandmother's house, I just always loved just sitting down and playing at the piano, even if I didn't know what I was doing. But then eventually, that love of sitting down at the piano turned into me sitting down and teaching myself how to play the piano after my aunt instilled this love of music essentially into my life, I wanted to learn as much as I could. Um, and grow, growing up in Holly, you know, I had a great music teachers mm -hmm. to teach me, you know, the basics and fundamentals, but then I took those basics and fundamentals and I turned them into something that when I was younger, I didn't realize where it would take me. Mm -hmm. And it's really taken me to a place I never imagined I would be right now. Yeah. Um, so, Heart and Soul, Chopsticks, are banned from my classroom when I teach now. <laughs> like, oh, I'm gonna play Chopsticks. I'm like, no, you're not. No Chopsticks, because it's just like that overly played thing that everybody wants to learn how to play. But I, I just remember being 
that was like the only thing I was really passionate about. Yeah. The only thing that I really felt that I was any good at I wasn't like a sports person. You know, I, I actually was called Twinkle Toes by my friend Amy Schiffauer. Amy Schiffauer. Shout out. We talked about hashtag Schiffy. <laughs> um, we were playing in, I think it was third or fourth grade, you know, mm-hmm. kickball. Exciting times yeah. on the field. And, you know, I was a big kid. You would think that I would be able to kick the ball and it would go far, but I literally ran up to the ball and it was a Charlie Brown moment. I kicked my leg out and I fell backwards. <laughs> that was that was my time on the sporting field. Yeah. You know, but I now that I'm older, I'm like, yeah, I really like sports. I like, you know, mm-hmm. tennis and you know, soccer and appreciation for, but I never really got into it in, in school. So I focused on what I could do musically. I played, you know, the first instrument that I picked up was the tenor saxophone. And I got bored with that and I said, can I play something else? They're like, yeah, we need a French horn player. You want to play that? Sure. So I started playing the French horn and band. The um, French horn and band turned into trumpet and jazz band. Trumpet yeah. and jazz band turned into, you know, all these other things. So it's just, I just wanted to learn as much as possible about music, doing it as well as I could and bringing me to the spot. So I, in college, yeah. my college voice teacher at Roberts Wesleyan. So did, you, you were doing all of these instruments at this point. Were you taking choir? Were you doing theater in middle school and high yep, school? Took okay. choir. My first um, musical experience at being in a musical was in fourth grade. I can't remember the name of the show, but I remember the um, song, There's No Place to Go But Up. It was the first song I sang, sang on stage. And actually, my character's name was Jeffrey. And my first, I can remember my first line. I can't believe yeah. the mayor would let Mr. Blah Blahs. You know, it's just like I still have this, but fourth grade musical. And throughout middle school, um, junior high school, I was in Georgia. Um, I mm-hmm. played Albert Peterson in Bye Bye Birdie. That was my first major lead. I would play Curly in Oklahoma because I had so much hair back then. <laughs> Very interesting that I don't have hair anymore, but that's okay. That's life, man. I know. We're all gonna get hair. It's all on my face. I don't think you're gonna lose your hair. You have nice hair. Well, I, I don't. I don't agree with that, but we'll, we'll see in time. It runs in my family. Okay. But okay. Was was this at a point? So when you were in middle school and high school, is this what made you decide to do voice? Because it sounds like you were versed in a lot of other stuff and playing piano. So when it was time for you to go to to go to school, I know that you had a couple stops yeah. at college along the way, but. You said you never thought you'd be studying this in music. So I know you kind of went to school, the original idea of vocal performance. I think you were just starting um, the story of your teacher, Roberts Wesleyan, who yeah. started to guide you in a different direction. Yes, my in ninth grade, in seventh or eighth grade, my choral director in Holly said, you have a really good voice. You should you know, take voice lessons. Um, also, I was really into musical th- at that point, he's like, you should take dance, yeah. um, go into musical theater, and um, so I started doing the whole player thing, but my, unfortunately, um, couldn't really afford the voice lessons, and um, my mother's probably going to kill me for saying this, but when I asked my father if I could take dance, he said, no, because it'll make you gay. So, it's very interesting that... 30 years later, I turned out to be gay after not taking dance classes. <laughs> um, so it wasn't the dance that made it. So, um, But that love that was instilled by my voice teacher and my yeah. uh, vocal coach in high school turned into going to college for um, music. I wasn't really intending to go to college for music. I think um, my dad would have rather that I like be something that was more like ministerial, a pre- mm. not a priest, but like a pastor. You came from a very religious household. I did. Yeah. Yeah. Very religious household that transformed from being Catholic into being um, not Catholic, uh, more born again Christian type of thing. Mm. So, um, but my my dad was more into like would wanted me more to follow like either a ministerial route or to go work at a factory. You know, just go make money, not go to college. Um, so this religious upbringing kind of brought you eventually to Roberts Wesley, which is a Christian school. Christian school. Yeah. 
Yeah, and I didn't necessarily go there because it was Christian. Mm -hmm. um, once I realized, I'm like, yeah, maybe I should go for voice. They had a really good vocal program there. Mm -hmm. And I had two fantastic teachers, um, actually three. Um, my freshman year, I had uh, one, Dr. Moser. He was fantastic. He was like tallest guy you could think of, manliest, basiest voice. I'm like, okay, cool. I want to sing like you. Yeah. Um, then my sophomore through um, senior year, I studied with Robert Shue and Judith Cohen. And it was Robert Schuen that said to me, because in college, I still kept on wanting to do everything. I wanted, I played French horn in the college community orchestra and the wind ensemble. I was playing piano a lot. I was in student government. I was the president of my senior class at Roberts Wesleyan. And he said to me, you need to focus on voice. Mm -hmm. He's like, you have an exceptional voice. You need to focus on voice. And I didn't follow, I didn't listen. And luckily, I think for myself that I didn't listen led me to where I am yeah. right now. Is that, so. So while you were you were at Roberts, that's when you started to go into education. Education. Yeah. Yeah. What What was the mindset switch for you? Going, you know, thinking you were going to do performance and really focusing on okay, how do I make Jeff better? and then kind of switching gears into learning how to make other people better and yeah. learning how to teach. Was that a big mindset switch for you? It was more of like, you have to have a career to fall back on and yeah. education was, you know, it's being a performer is iffy. Yeah. <laughs> education was something a little bit more sound. And one of the things that I told my students a few weeks ago at our theater banquet, I said, you know, I never intended to teach. I intended to be a performer. Um, but it was probably the best decision that I made was to go into education because it really taught me how to be, to work with people. Yeah. More and still know that I could sing and perform. You, you, know, you, you spent the last about a decade at Aquinas, which is, you know, Jeff is um, leaving, he's moving on to kind of pursue a performance, the performance part of his career. So we, I, this part of the reason I wanted to talk to him. One of the things I learned from um, interviewing you and interviewing a couple of your current former students and your fellow professors, your colleagues, was that even though you are teaching, as you said, this has given you an opportunity to still sing, mm -hmm. to work with people. I understand that you started in college exploring composition more um, and songwriting as well, and you were able to carry that into Aquinas. And were you able to develop there as well? I was, actually, and that's where I wrote uh, full musical yeah. um, called Immortally Yours based on a very popular teenage vampire series. I wonder Ooh, what that can be. Hmm. Um, but I, I, I get inspiration from reading yeah. and I wrote another I wrote another song which actually is going to be performed this weekend with the Rochester Gay Men's Chorus mm -hmm. called I Close My Eyes after I read another very popular wizarding hmm. But uh, I get a lot of inspiration from <laughs> reading and from stuff like that. So being yeah. in Aquinas, I read this very popular book, and I sat down, and I just doodled something at the piano, and what that's just playing, noodled, sorry, not doodled, but noodled something on the piano, I recorded it, sent it off to my friend Brian Norris, and I said, hey, can you write lyrics to this little ditty? And then all of a sudden we wrote a two-act musical. So, yeah. yeah, being at Aquinas is really, has really opened up things in terms of composition and writing music for myself. Part two with Jeff Wilson. We just finished talking about his time at Aquinas, how that allowed him to develop as a musician. So one of the things that we're now going to talk about is the music itself. The background, you've explained that a lot of this time you spent, a lot of this was self-taught and you branched out and you had a lot of different areas of focus, jazz ensemble, orchestra, wind ensemble, choir. How did the music, when you first you know, because when you write something and you arrange, it's kind of documenting what you know. Right. 
and it's it's a teaching tool for yourself as well. So if you could kind of walk us through maybe what you were listening to at the time during before you started composing and how what you listened to and what you played it affected everything and maybe compare and contrast what what Jeff Wilson music was when it was beginning developing the point it's at now. Okay. So the first thing I remember ever writing was my senior year of high school. I mm-hmm. I decided that I wanted to write a song for a a friend of mine who I became very good friends with. His name is Nicholas. He was a German exchange student. So I wrote this song for him um, called Don't Let Time Tear Us Apart. Long title. But I... That's I'm a like, title made for Broadway. And I know. That's, that, is per- <laughs> that is beautiful. That is perfect for Broadway. Yeah, it is perfect for Broadway. So I wrote this, you know, this poem. I'm like, I should like put music to it. I should, so I just sat down at the piano and I just started playing. And I'm like, oh, this is actually working. So, mm-hmm. um, so I wrote this song and I, I, I gave it to him as a, like as a farewell gift type thing. And then I said to the choir director in Holly at the time, I'm like, can we sing this as a graduation song? So we ended up singing the song, Don't Let Time Tear Us Apart, at our uh, high school graduation. I was the only one um, out of the, you know, 20 so that were in the singing in the choir that made it through the entire thing without crying. I'm just like smiling away, so I'm like, yeah, I'm graduating, getting out of Holly, going off to Roberts Wesleyan College. Every, I look up on the risers and everybody was sobbing. I'm like, oh, I guess it's meaningful. <laughs> so, um, so that was my first first song I ever wrote, and the funny thing is, I the only music that I really listened to from the time I was, um, you know, in like seventh grade all the way through high school, like ending high school was like going to church and listening to church music because um, we really didn't listen to the radio a lot in the car um, because rock music was not all that wonderful. Yep. Um, so. A lot of the music that I was exposed to was music at church, but also the music that we sang in choir in high school and, you know, the music that I played in band. So I think that really had a big influence on on the music that I started to really like and um, to kind of ingrain it into my brain. Um, when I was in college, I really didn't do a lot of composition. I, you know, I did a lot of music theory and mm-hmm. like having to write stuff in music theory. Um, but then I really didn't get into writing music again until I started teaching at Nazareth Academy. And I'm like, oh, hey, I kind of want to go back to this whole thinking, you know, maybe Nazareth I, was your second teaching stop, Second right? teaching stop. Yeah. Yep. Good for you for paying attention. Um, second teaching stop. So I, that's when I read that teenage fantasy book about wizarding Mm -hmm. and that's when I wrote the song I Close My Eyes and again I just sat down at the piano I was inspired by what I read sat down at the piano I played something and I handed what I played off to my friend Catherine Marsh and I said Kathy can you write lyrics to this and it it has to do with this um, book that I read and she's like yeah absolutely Mm -hmm. so a couple like two weeks later she just sent me this beautiful text um, based on book five of this popular wizarding book and I so I took what she wrote I put it down um, mm-hmm. vocals wrote, uh, wrote a melody to it sang it I um, recorded it I sent it off to, I sent it, it. <laughs> sent it sent I it sent it sent it Jeff you sent it I am a teacher <laughs> I sent it off to um, uh, Warner Brothers and said hey wow. This is something that I wrote based on this the movie at the time too, and I sent it to the author of the book, and I got a nice little letter back from Warner wow. Brothers saying thank you so much for your um, your submission. Unfortunately, we can't accept third party submissions from anybody. We can't even listen to it because if it ends up somewhere, like right. I can sue. Um, then I sent it to the author, and I got a letter back from the publicist saying. Thank you so much for your interest in blah blah books and um unfortunately miss you know who is yeah um a little bit too much she in, who shall not be she named. who shall not be named is um very busy with her phil- philanthropic work so yeah. and you know but thank you very much for being a fan so 
I said, okay. So I took, it was such an honor to get even, like, I still have the letters, you know, yeah. that I got. But I said, okay, I have this really nice melody. I have these amazing, this amazing text. So I went back to Kathy and I said, Kathy, you know, as I'm reading this, it really is a reflection on my life. So can we just modify it to, from being about this book and about this movie to being about Jeff? So she got right to it and almost immediately sent it back to me and it came into fruition being called I Close My Eyes. Mm. And it's my life. It's my story about coming out of the closet as a gay yeah. person. Um, and the text uh, is very much in terms of hiding and being ashamed about who I was and, and because especially with the religious background that I had, it was it was not a good thing to be gay. Um, so was it was this your first experience in your music where you kind of had this catharsis where you sort of you know realized that a lot of what you had been feeling and you were able to put it out there and I mean that's very difficult you know having to kind of hide who you were and being ashamed of it and I, I know also that you mentioned that you were a, a bigger kid yeah and I know that some of those weight issues translate into adult but too so was yeah. this the first time that all of these trials kind of came upon you and then after that has all of your music followed the same sort of theme or is this something you kind of call upon selectively um, it's, it is selective sometimes, most mm -hmm. of the time, yes, and I write things depending on what I need at that moment, right. you know, I've written a lot of graduation songs, um, for classes that I've, I've worked with in the past, but this was really the first, like, the cathartic, um, moment for me in my life was, and I actually wrote it as I was about to go pretty much into surgery to have gastric bypass surgery at 400 pounds, um, yeah. yeah, it was very much that moment, and it was my my life on in print, and I, to this day, I still, you know, it, it's weird how guilt just follows you, you know, and it's weird how I, I don't like to label things, and I, I like to label myself as being a human being. I'm a very good human being. I, mm -hmm. The fact that I'm gay doesn't have anything to do with how I live my life as a human being. Yeah. So, and that's kind of where I am right now. And I'm writing a lot of music right now kind of about being human. Yeah. Um, so that's kind of where I'm at. Did I answer your question? You did. It. <laughs> it, was, it was a good answer. And kind of tying in to your struggles... Um, coming out of the closet and dealing with your identity uh, you've written a couple pieces for the Rochester Gay Men's Choir do they kind of follow in the same theme and I, and I, I know before you answer I know that you have mentioned that a couple of these pieces bear more meaning after the mass shooting in Orlando so if you could kind of walk us through what you've done for them yeah actually the one one piece that they're doing is the one that I was just talking about I closed my eyes I arranged it for um, men's choir and so they're gonna be singing that on on Saturday but another one is called blessed are they and it's a song um, that is based on the Beatitudes of Christ and I've gotten to the point where I'm a very religious person, but I'm not a very, I'm not really into the whole Christian church anymore. Mm -hmm. I'm just getting into that like feeling of like I am a good person, <laughs> and but I really, really love the principles of of Jesus and what he was on earth mm -hmm. talking about and saying, okay, stop being jerks and follow these principles love one another be good to one another accept everybody for who they are and that's kind of where the beatitudes came from because i really love the text so what i did was i wrote this whole probably four minute introduction that's just orchestra and it's actually the first thing that i've written for like mm -hmm. more parts than just piano and vocals and strings um so it's just it's kind of like a reflection on on those words a musical reflection on those words and after that four minutes is over the choir comes in and 
and sings um, the text. And there's a soloist, a tenor soloist, kind of serving as Jesus and singing the solo. But then the orchestra joins back in and it ends with this, you know, very climactic ending, beautiful ending. Um, so I took that to Rob Strauss, who's the director of the Roster Gaiman's course. I said, hey, would you want to do this? And their concert is actually all, a, a, for the Saturday, is all premiere music. It's like the first time it's really been doing, or that the RGMC has done in the past, but they've premiered in the past, or brand new work by composers like myself. So he's like, yeah, that would be great. And I'm like, well, there's four minutes of just music in the beginning. Would you mind if I involve the Aquinas dancers? Nice. So my best friend and the director of dance at um, Aquinas Institute where I teach, Donna Brett, has choreographed this beautiful movement piece to the beginning of the song. So it's, um, it's kind of cool because it's bringing the message of the Beatitudes being sung by gay men, mm -hmm. being danced by Catholics or possible Catholics, and it's, it kind of goes to show how much our world has changed in the attitudes towards people who are gay and different. But it also, after what has happened this past weekend, it makes us think that there's so much more that we need yeah. to do in order to stop hate from happening. And for me, it's going to be a very emotional moment because I'm actually going to be conducting the orchestra and Rob's going to be conducting the choir at the same time. So working with such amazing singers, mm -hmm. but humans and individuals and putting this together is I, I, I know that I'm going to be very emotional. Mm -hmm. So, so for my students that say I don't have any emotion, come on Saturday, I'll probably be crying. So. Is this the kind of music that we're going to hear Jeff Wilson in concert June 30th? It's 8 p.m., correct? 7 p.m. 7 p.m. at the Aquinas Institute. So is this the kind of music we're going to be hearing from Jeff? What can, this is just going to be you and a piano. Yes. Correct? So what, kind of ending us off, what can, if someone goes to your concert, the $10 general. General admission. Yep, general admission. What, what can they expect from Jeff Wilson? in concert. They're going to um, hear the story of my life mm -hmm. through music. Yeah. So um, just how I am as a musician and who I am as a musician and I'm going to be telling stories about how each song came to fruition and then the music is very much, um, if you think a combination of Jim Brickman playing the piano and Josh Groban singing, Josh Groban, I know you have if hair If you've got a Groban wig man, this is, the, this is the time to rock it. Yeah. Um, Actually, my favorite thing is Josh Groban seeing Kanye tweets. Oh my God! Well, we'll find we'll we'll find the link and we'll 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 okay. put it in there. For I'm sorry, everybody. was I not supposed to mention that? No, it's uh, all right. Okay, so yeah, Josh Groban, yeah. Jim Brickman, storytelling, okay. my story, my life, and that's essentially what it is. So. Je Jeff, thank you so much for joining us. Thank this is a Dan. wonderful interview. We'll put all of Jeff's social media information on there. He's very good. We'll put a link to an event. Thank you so much for tuning in, Jeff. Thanks for chatting with us. Thank you, Dan. We'll see you next time. Close my eyes And I see All that I am meant to be I close my eyes And I find A world If I am